Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and our friend Brian Broom, and today we're talking about Dominion. So earlier this week, when I was doing prep and setting up an outline for this episode, um, I threw together a short, vague outline after reading the things that I was supposed to read, and Greg, you sent me back an email that said, quite rightly, that I had totally missed the point. I did not say that. (laughs) That would be rude. You said it much more tactfully, but that is what you said. Because I had, in (laughs) fact, missed what made your writings on this topic sort of distinct from the other existing discourse on this topic. And that's potentially because I wasn't familiar with the other existing discourse on this topic. (laughs) So why don't you bring me and our listeners up to speed on that, and then we'll go from there. The history of um, the discussion of the cultural mandate, I suppose, starts with Abraham Kuyper and his disciples. It was kind of a Dutch thing, and it was this renewed emphasis upon the crown rights of Christ over all of creation. All good. But as time passed in that tradition, there there seemed to be more and more of a, this is something beside the gospel, beside God's written word. This is something that's addressed by God's creation ordinances, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not something where we appeal specifically to scripture. And the connection between gospel evangelism, personal sanctification and growth in, in Christ, and this cultural thing, the, the, the connections were not always clear. And as this motif began to spread into Christian education of all sorts and into Presbyterian and Reformed theology more generally, the problem sort of remained. Some people were very suspicious of this talk about cultural mandate, culture, or later, I think it was Gary North who probably coined the phrase dominion mandate, because it seemed to sap the gospel uh, of its vitality, or at least steered the church away from what they perceived to be its focus toward cultural issues, which are not exactly the church as the church's forte. And I think we're at a point now, this is my perception at least, and maybe I missed a lot, that we have a sort of tug of war between those who want to emphasize evangelism, missionary activity, the Great Commission, and those who want to say, yes, that's fine and all, but culture, dominion, pressing the claims of Christ in all, in all of culture, all of life. And then, particularly of late, I've heard these voices that say, well, the church, the, the, the answer is easy. In the church, we preach the gospel from the Bible. Out in the rest of, of the world, thanks to cultural, uh, thanks to common grace, we are involved in various cultural activities, uh, sort of as if Christ had, I don't know, two kingdoms or something. <laughs> and, and none of these is exactly uh, a happy solution, nor do I think in the long run it's what the Bible's talking about. And, and I think some of the criticisms that teaching on the cultural mandate originally received, I think were deflected too easily. Rather, I think people should have stopped and said, well, yes, wait. What are we missing? Because I, I don't think the solution's that difficult. But after being involved in Christian education for nearly 40 years now and writing on this topic, in fact, I wrote a booklet called um, Dominion, a Biblical Primer, and it really is a primer now that I look back at it. There's so much that I missed and didn't say. I, I, I think I seem a little more clearly what's really going on here. And, and this is not to dismiss the wonderful work that writers in all kinds of traditions have contributed to this discussion, but I think it might be to give it a little more focus than it's generally received. And again, I'm not going to say I'm the only person who's ever said this, let alone the first. But anyway, I think we can, I think by going back and looking at what was really going on in Genesis 1, we can see that there actually not only is no conflict between the Great Commission and the Dominion Mandate, but in some ways they are exactly the same thing, except for one small thing, sin. Mm -hmm. Sin has crippled any direct fulfillment of the Dominion Mandate. And the emphasis of the Great Commission 
will lead us back there almost naturally, spiritually, if we understand that the, the cultural the Great Commission is not simply a call for evangelism, but a call for discipleship. And that's what I'd sort of like to talk about. The this idea of not simply coming to Christ and trusting in Christ and being born again, as obviously important, that isn't a starting point for anything. Christ did not simply come to make converts. He came to make disciples. Mm -hmm. Well, he came to do more than that. And that's, that's what I'd like to talk about. When we look at the dominion mandate, it appears in Genesis. We, we think immediately of the be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over all these creatures. And we, we now tend to highlight the word dominion a good deal. Uh, Kuiper and his followers, I think, stress maybe perhaps the more the subdue it. And yet, as you look at the thing, the first thing you should notice is that God says the same thing three times in three different ways. And it amounts to have children, have children, have children. <laughs> A capitalist or Marxist mentality, that is one that's solely interested in economics, might look and say, well, we need a large labor force to harness the resources of the planet. <laughs> that's true. And I think that's maybe what I actually wrote someplace sometime about something. But if we look pull back and look at the verses before and after, we see this discussion of the image of God. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then there's a discussion amongst the persons of the Trinity about let's make man, let's, let's give him dominion. And so God made man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he him. And then God said, and we, and we get it again, the dominion mandate. This idea of God replicating his image a million billion fold in this finite space we call earth that's what the whole thing is emphasizing and that's part of this have children have children have children because remember we're before the fall every child born into the world would be the unfallen image of god mm -hmm. innocent bent toward righteousness but with room to grow in that image mm -hmm. and as adam and eve for the first time heard all of this uh, my own belief is that God either spoke it aloud or, or perhaps actually handed them a document that said, this is going to be the first chapter of the Bible, read it. Um, I think we have to assume that they knew what had gone before because they had to know that they were the image of God. And for that to have any context, they hadn't read the Westminster Confession, uh, the Catechism, <laughs> or the Heidelberg Catechism, which is a little less thorough, but in the long one says some, some deeper things if you go far enough. They hadn't even read, read St. Paul. Where Paul in Ephesians and Colossians talks about being created in knowledge after the image of the creator, being created in righteousness and true holiness. That was all off in the future. What they had the most was Genesis 1, the, that section of scripture that calls itself the generations of the heavens and the earth, the part that only God was there as a witness to. And as they looked at that, or as God told them this, they would, image of God, huh, what do we know about God? Well, Creator, maker, <laughs> wisdom, power, beauty, harmony, melody, shape, texture, speaking, dividing, igniting fire, blessing, communication. All of they, they would they would read all through that section of scripture, meditate upon it, and they would say, Oh, this is the image of God. They wouldn't have a, a shorthand theological formula yet. Maybe they came up with one eventually. But at this point, they would have the first chapter of Genesis, and it would show them an amazingly creative, inventive God who specializes in beauty, wisdom, order, and complexity in the midst of simplicity, one in the, in the midst of many, unity and diversity, all of these things going together. And they would say, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> we're supposed to pick up where our father started and, and, and go from there. We're told that when God looked upon his creation, it was dark. Darkness is upon the face of the deep. It was uh, empty. And it was un unformed. And immediately, God begins to change that. He turns on the lights, which is what any intelligent person would do when they start a task. <laughs> Ow, it's dark in here. <laughs> Ow, oh, uh, uh. hey, turn on the lights. 
Have you ever noticed in mystery shows and detective shows how they never turn on the lights when they go into a search room? Anyway, <laughs> intelligent people turn on lights. You can't surprise bad guys hiding in the dark if you turn <laughs> yeah. the light on first. Yeah, this, mm, yeah, yeah. We'll get in that, I guess. <laughs> uh, but then God begins ordering this, dividing this from that. This is day, this is night, this is heaven, this is earth, this is sea. And then spreads out the illumination. Okay, stars, sun, moon, filling, animals, plants, beasts, cattle. Uh, and there comes a point, and this all leads up to the point where God stops with the job unfinished and turns to Adam and Eve and says, now you're my image, fill the earth. And so they can look and say, wow, well, what did our father do? Well, he brought light. He brought order. He filled everything with his presence. And he did so. And he did it cool. <laughs> Just look at that. Look how beautiful that is. It, it is unlikely that their first thought was, and this obviously means we need to be philosophers and theologians. <laughs> it probably came, we need to, we need to build some stuff. We need, I mean, but it needs to be beautiful stuff. It needs to be really cool stuff. It needs to be complex stuff. But we're going to have to start small because we have zero experience here. Yeah, and we're going to need a lot of help before this is over. A lot. Look at the planet, Adam. We need a lot of help. <laughs> children, children, children. It is at this point in the conversation that you should ask me what the most reformed thing I've ever said is. What is the most reformed thing you've ever said, Emily? The most reformed thing I think I've ever said is the only image of God we're supposed to make is babies. Ooh, that is so reformed. Yes. Super reformed. <laughs> you get 10 uh, commandments out of 10. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that's like, how that works. Is it? I don't know. I thought that was like Rotten Tomatoes, where you you're, were, were. Yeah, I was. I was, I was giving you a rating on your reformed yeah. level. Yeah. Can, yeah. can you do that with the commandments? I thought well, there were twelve can... commandments. <laughs> Not even going there. Anyway, <laughs> continue on. <laughs> now, given what I said, the temptation is to shift back to the the children as a labor force or as more help, and that's certainly true. There's a planet out there that kind of sets the, the parameters for the task. But what God is after is his image. But his image is not static. We don't just sit there on a hillside and stare at heaven and say, here I am, God, I'm your image. Hope you're enjoying me. That's boring. It would be boring for God just as it would be boring for us. We To be the image of God, we need to be like our Father, moving, shaping, creating, making. But the end product, the, the, the thing we make with our hands, is not nearly as important to God as who we make ourselves or he, who he makes us mm -hmm. through this process of being creative. And because it is a communal task, I help you, you help me, there's something else that's very important in all this, and that's I help you and you help me, which mm -hmm. means there are times when you lead and I follow, often like the podcast here, <laughs> and sometimes I lead and you follow, like our high school days when I was here, theater director. We, we each take our turn. You can think here of all of Lewis's remarks about creation as the great dance, where the roles are constantly changing. And it's this kind of thing when I, when I learn, I'm not always a leader, and sometimes I need to be quiet and listen to other people who know more. That's called humility. And then when it turns to me and, say, and I'm told, wait, you have the talent here, you need to do this. Now I have to be a leader. That's called courage and wisdom, because I need to do so firmly, intelligently, and gently, without lording it over one another. Now I am a shepherd guiding people, but it's going to switch around to someone else, and so it's you and me, oh, and then it's him over there. And now we both need to be quiet and follow that person. In an unfallen world, this would be a beautiful and in some ways simple thing, <laughs> but it would still be a thing. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve were not automatically versed in all righteousness and holiness. Is there biblical grounds for this? Yeah, Jesus. We're told that as a young boy, he grew in wisdom and in knowledge and in favor with God and man. Favor with man, oh, that's easy. It took people a while to get used to him, but eventually they like this, this crazy kid who never got in trouble or did anything wrong. That's not what that <laughs> means. Uh, sure didn't get in favor with his uh, half-siblings or foster siblings. But um, favor with God. He moved from innocence, never having done any wrong, 
into greater and greater righteousness where he faced life's daily chores, submitting to sinful parents, putting up with sinful siblings, living in a sinful world, and and suffering the common effects of the curse, and faithfully, cheerfully submitting to his father's will at each step, so that even as a young boy, this was true of him. He moved into greater and greater maturity, not that he ever failed or was anything other than innocent and, and to a degree righteous, but that righteousness grew as it faced temptations. And so when we come to Gethsemane and, and we see him struggling with, with the cross, uh, the one thing he never does is question his father, his obedience to his father's will. He's going to do what the father says. That's, that's a given. He just wants to know, have I missed something? Is there... Is there something here? And his humanity is asking, is there something here? I don't want to be separated from you, Father. I don't want your wrath turned against me. I've never known anything but your love. Have I missed something? And as we watch him struggle through that, he goes from, if it be possible, take this cup away, not your, not my will, but yours, to accept this cup may not pass, except I drink it, your will be done. And then finally he emerges, and Peter goes for the sword, and Jesus says, Peter, the cup that my father has given me, shall I not drink of it? The writer of Hebrews say, says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. So, yes, it is not only possible, but necessary for those who are innocent and have the beginnings of righteousness to grow in that righteousness. And even in an unfallen world, there would still be tasks to do, challenges. They wouldn't involve sin. There'd be no dragons to slay. There'd be no demons to cast out. There would still be mountains to climb and equations to solve and new technologies to invent. And the mastering of this art or that art, becoming a better painter, a better sketcher, better architect, mastering the laws of physics to create uh, things that are of, of greater practicality and greater beauty. All of this would be there. And uh, sometimes we get the idea, I think, that unfallen people would be super geniuses, virtual gods who would know everything and do everything without <laughs> any effort. And it's not the way the world works. It's not the way the world has ever worked. And even in innocence, even in righteousness, there is that thing called a challenge where mm -hmm. we have to stop and turn mm -hmm. to God and say, I need your help here. I don't. <laughs> I, how, why did Jesus spend so much time in prayer to his father? <laughs> well, a lot of reasons. But he kept going back, and because in his humanity, he needed to keep on track. He needed grace. We're told that he, the child was full of grace, and, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. This, this is what it meant for him to be the second Adam, what Adam, what the first Adam wasn't. So as, as we look at what was, that's what could have been. This, this is the world the dominion mandate assumes. All of humanity working together unfallen, loving God with all their heart and soul and mind, but growing in that love, growing in that faithfulness, growing in that trust, growing in, the, in, in learning all the surprising things that God will do when you ask, and all this incredible surprising things that are, are hidden and implicit in the creation order that we can find if we will just trust God and, and seek his wisdom. It's all there, but, but we have to work together. We have to form this community this interdependent relationship, this organic body. And we'll know that we're somewhere near there when we're filling the earth and changing it into something that 4,000, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, we could never have dreamed of, however long mm -hmm. it takes to fill the earth. It would have been faster in an unfallen world because people <laughs> wouldn't be dying all the time. <laughs> yeah. So that was the original and God would delight in that. God would delight. Yes, the glorified earth is nice. Yeah, yeah the, the pretty picture is nice. But the child has become a master artist. That's better. The, the child who can play one song to perfection, that's wonderful. The child who had, but, but it's beyond that. I just want to hear that one. I just want to hear Billy Joel do Piano Man over and over again. <laughs> you know, is there another song someplace? Can we learn something else? Can we get past just It's a good just one, that? but we do need more than that. We do need more than that. Even the Hallelujah Chorus, you know, we need yeah. more. The rest of Messiah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then something beyond that, we need the artist himself who's mm -hmm. capable, who's become the creator and who through a boundless eternity can keep on creating. 
Are you familiar with uh, the Christian music artist Andrew Peterson? I, Brian, is, Brian is giving thumbs up. I don't think so. A- Andrew Peterson is very good. Yeah, yeah, he's he's great. He has um, some really excellent poetry and some excellent meditations on this concept. He has a song called "Let There Be Light" mm-hmm. that is a meditation on how when his band gets on the stage, they are imitating God. They, just as God created to the song of the morning stars, they're creating to the sound of their mandolins. And they're, they're, they stood on the stage and they sang and they played and they said that it was good. And it, I really hadn't put that together until I listened to the song recently that was like creating into chaos, mm-hmm. making things as art is something that we can do. And that's an imitation of God and it's good. It's not that we say, let there be light. And it's some sort of blasphemous thing that we're taking the words of God to ourselves, but rather we are thinking God's thoughts after him and smaller. (laughs) (laughs) To coin a phrase. I did have, I did have one thought about you. You made a comment about uh, it's unlikely that the very first thought they had is let's be theologians and philosophers, (laughs) not, entirely disagreeing with you but i i just want to rebut part of that is uh so i guess i am disagreeing with you never mind (laughs) that's allowed when they when they would have first started the tasks that you know whatever first task they would have set about it probably would have entered into their mind we should have some terminology for this and some language and we should know what these words mean when we tell them to other people as well which absolutely in a, a very broad sense is a philosophy of language. Mm-hmm. No, I completely yeah. agree. And I, I said what I did very carefully. <laughs> I said they would not have said, let's mm. be theologians and philosophers. Correct. They would have become such immediately <laughs> because what, what are they doing? They're listening to what God said. They're interpreting it and they're acting upon it. Yeah. Ima- imagine being a perfect theologian immediately. That'd be pretty, not yeah, that my theology point, would be perfect, but. <laughs> yeah, my point was, was not to put down theology and philosophy, but to put down the kind of thinking that idolizes abstraction. Uh, they would yes. have immediately got into it and they may have realized instantly or, or somewhere down the line, oh, wait a minute, we need a need, we, we need a name for this. As you say, we're talking about God. And yeah, you, you know me. I think that, that naming things is terribly important. <clears throat> we all love Princess Bride, move the thing and the other thing. Because we know that, that to accomplish any task, you need names. When I teach my physical science class to freshmen, uh, I do an entire lecture about Adam and Eve trying to explore the garden and trying to communicate to one another time and distance. <laughs> <laughs> using what exactly? <laughs> and I think we usually end up with heartbeats and paces. Mm-hmm. And I, went, I went that direction about uh, 30 paces and it took me about, you know, 50 heartbeats or whatever. <laughs> it reminds me of the thing from uh, that hideous strength. Yes. The other McPhee. one. No. You know, <laughs> we'll put that speak in the a other language one, entirely <laughs> devoid of nouns. <laughs> <laughs> this and put it in the thing and the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it reminds us too of the promise that we have that in the new creation we we won't call each other teachers and fathers because every one of us shall know the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the situation there this, that they're in communion with God. They don't have the need of dividing up this office of philosopher and theologian because they all know God intimately and personally and individually and collectively. All at once, all the adverbs. And each one, though, it, as he works at his task, will discover something about God's faithfulness and God's wisdom that other people haven't picked up on yet. Yeah. And so he'll be eager, say, I learned something new about God. It's really cool. Let me talk to you. And everyone else in humility will stop and say, Tell us, please tell us. <laughs> not, Well, how old are you? What generation were you born in? <laughs> You're not worthy of our attention. When you've been around a thousand years more. Then you can actually tell us some. Yeah, it would it would just have been this incredible kind of interrelationship that was earth spanning, generation spanning, and full of perfect love as people work together to create a thing. Oh, and then this is what I was I was forgetting earlier. I think 
When Jesus confronted the Sadducees, he made the point that marriage is only for this life. And he said, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Not knowing the scriptures. Where did the scriptures ever say that marriage was only for this life? I, I worked over that for decades. And our good friend David Farshman and I discussed it. And we both looked at that and said, oh, yeah, well, we're dumb too. We don't get it. <laughs> and it's only been fairly recently now that it became obvious. Fill the earth. Mm. That's a measurable thing. Uh, and something else came to me with just within the last few months. Sabbath day, God rested from his labors. Adam and Eve could assume that since they're in the image of God, not only do they get one day and seven off, but there's an end to their labors. There's an end when there's a time when marriage won't be needed anymore. Even in an unfallen world, there would be a point where we're done. This part of the story's over. We're ready for next level. We're ready for a transformation and a glorification. Yeah. You know. So in, implicit in the original command was a time link. Now, God knew what it was. We don't. We, I mean, we could probably do some kind of measuring and figure that by the time people are shoulder to shoulder, we're, we're done. But someplace in there, they knew there would be an ending. Now, here's the question. Shakespeare. If they had made something really cool, as cool as Shakespeare and better, would it survive the transformation into the next life? Mm. And we face that today as we talk about what we have made in the wake of sin. Everything's contaminated by sin. Is it going? Is Shakespeare going to survive into the new heavens and the new earth? How about the Golden Gate Bridge? How about those parts of the Netherlands that have been reclaimed by technology from the ocean? What? How about the fields we've planted, the forests we've we've sown? Do those make the transformation or is it all scratched away? I don't know all of the answers, but I do know one answer now that's very important. We may or may not have Hamlet, but we'll have the man who wrote him and he'll be getting better through all eternity. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be stupider. He'll remember <laughs> what he wrote, what he went through to get there, and he'll know how to do it even better next time. And so with all of our arts, maybe not everything we make here will pass the judgment and the resurrection. I, I don't claim to understand how the, all that's going to work. I do know that the new heavens and the new earth are a physical reality that creation redeemed from the bondage of corruption and brought into the liberty of the children of God. But whether or not the artifacts survive, the people who made them, the skills they acquired in the process do survive. They've been transformed, they've grown, they've matured, we've matured. And we don't lose it all. Now, some things are going to be a little bit difficult. Um, morticians are right out of a job. <laughs> so are, you know, policemen and a few other things. Doctors, as we know them, we don't know exactly what the resurrection body is going to be like. But even though, even there, there's going to the process of learning about biology. They have that. They're going to have a much better start than those of us like me who never took a biology class. Uh, the knowledge won't be lost and the skill and the, the learning to work hard and learning to think and learning to submit to God to grow in obedience in the face of adversity, trusting in a sovereign God. None of that's lost. And that does pass over into eternity. So uh, one of the, the things that all of this gets at is the rejection of the idea that heaven or after Christ's second coming eternity, we're not going to be vaguely white glowing orbs with angel wings just kind of milling about for eternity. <laughs> playing because the harp. Playing the harp and occasionally thinking, wow, it's so great that we're here now instead of on earth. <sighs> because that is is really something more rooted in Gnosticism where oh, we, yes. we shed away the physical and now we're just in spirit bodies exclusively. There's nothing, there's nothing like what we had there. Um, and instead what we, we should recognize is that the resurrection is a resurrection to physical bodies, glorified yes. physical bodies, but they're, they're, they're physical. They're made of stuff Yeah. and a renewed remade creation following in the the steps of the first fruits, which is Christ. Yes. And it's all redeemed. Yes. What I what I see a lot is is people basically thinking, well, heaven's gonna be so boring because there's nothing to do. 
<laughs> <laughs> and the, the first thing we should realize is that even if there wasn't any of this other stuff that we could, we could still be doing, engaging in creation in, in a glorified, perfect way now, we'd still be in the presence of the perfectly true, good, and beautiful God mm -hmm. and worshiping him for eternity. That should satisfy us. We don't need anything else. But God is good, and he <laughs> wants his goodness and mercy to overflow in even more ways. And recognizing that eternity is not going to be hanging out with God in our disembodied state forever and playing harp occasionally, it is going to be so much more than that. Yeah. The idea of, and this, this would be a place we could segue and won't, into the whole idea of what does it mean to worship God? Is it only in the direct communion of prayer and praise and God's self-revelation to us? Or is there more? Well, we look at how Adam and Eve were created and God called them to him one day out of seven. The rest of the time, their worship was of a different sort, but it nonetheless was worship. So this dichotomy didn't exist. There was a difference. There's a difference between the Sabbath day and the other days of the week. But it was a difference that so that the one flowed out into the other, not built walls around itself and shut out the other. Question, where where are you getting the, the one day and seven in the garden? Because I remember it saying the cool of the day, but I don't remember it specifying a, a weekly meeting at that point. It's, uh, that's a good question. Biblical theology, again, expanding across the whole of Scripture, God rested on one day in seven. He did not say, hey, y'all do this. What he said was, you're my image. I'm doing this. I'm your father. You're my children. Mm -hmm. And like good obedient children, they would say, hey, our father's doing this. We're his image. Oh, that means, and as we follow throughout scripture, we see that God at some point, certainly by the by the time of Mount Sinai in the Exodus, God sets a day that is preeminently a day of worship. Now, worship continued throughout the week. There were sacrifices offered every day in the Temple and Tabernacle, mm -hmm. but the Sabbath was a special day of worship when special things happened. The lamps were trimmed in a special way, the um the showbread was put out, the sacrifices were doubled. God emphasized that. And when we get to the New Testament, we have this thing called the Lord's Day. And as we read through Revelation, we see the first thing that happens on the Lord Day, Lord's Day is that Jesus shows up in the midst of his churches. He comes to meet with his people in the churches as the churches are gathered. And when John is caught up into heaven, he sees the other side of this. He sees the church surrounding the throne of God. The church is in heaven, or Jesus is in the churches. It's the same same idea. So this is a common theme of a specialness when God draws near in a special way for that special kind of communion. And yet there's the rest of the week. Even in the New Covenant, there's the rest of the week, and there's a lot to do. Some of it will be after the pattern of church worship, singing and praising God and praying and such. And some of it will be a lot of sweat and a lot of swinging of hammers and drilling with drills and uh, playing keyboards and typing computers and, you know, whatever else we do in this crazy world. But there, the Bible does make a distinction between the holiness of the altar and the holiness of society. In uh, Zechariah 14, as uh, the prophet sees the messianic kingdom, he says that in that day, everything will be holiness to the Lord. And the every vessel in Jerusalem will be the whole will be holiness to the Lord. The horses' bridles will be holiness to the Lord, and the the, the pots will be the, the common pots will be as those that are before the altar. Mm. But he doesn't say they'll be the altar. Worship, rightly understood, should sanctify all of life. It flows outward into everything that we do, and that's why in the New Covenant it comes at the first day of the week. We come and we meet with Jesus, and then he dismisses us into the world with his grace and blessing. But now we're kind of on this time cycle. Presumably in the world to come, it will be different because we'll be constantly in the presence of Jesus. But again, those are things where we stand back and say, whoa, it'll be really good. 
Now, having done all that, and that was that's all great. We will, before we run out of time, we need to start tr trying to complete the equation because someone's going to say, "But wait, that sounds great, but the fall, sin." <laughs> Didn't that just screw up everything? Didn't we just lose it all? Didn't God just give up and say, well, that didn't work. So let's try something completely different. That let's sounds like something God would do, right? <laughs> yeah. Not God would have... Plan. Yeah. Yeah. God... Well, you know, backup plan. Plan B. Sounds like dispensationalism. Um, God would... Uh, yeah. Would, would, would God say, oh, Satan didn't see it coming. You got me on that one. Well, we'll make sure that never happens again. But yeah, you got me. You got me this one time. Really? Is God going to let Satan go through all of eternity, sniggering up his sleeve and saying, okay, I'm suffering hell, but once I beat him, <laughs> he ha I made him change his plan. I screwed it up. He had to settle for second best and it cost him his son's life. I'm pretty cool. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's, that's, that's not it. You know, we, we know that God planned all of these things and for his glory. So what we should see is not that God abandoned that plan, but God said, you think it was cool before? Now watch this. Mm -hmm. And now God's going to accomplish that same thing, but he's got to do it in the face of sin and his own curse on sin. He's got to do it in the face of a humanity that in large part is going to be hostile. And the only part that's not hostile is the part that he actually grabs and brings over to his side. That's a whole lot more difficult. And how in the world do you do that? I mean, here are these rebels because justice demands their execution. And even if he wants to salvage this plan, and even if he wants to love these little rebels, how in the world can he possibly do that? This is an impossible mystery story that requires an impossible hero with an impossible solution. Let's just all give it up and go home and let God dump the universe into hell, right? Or, and in the next 4,000 years of human history, are God hinting at the solution? And for 4,000 years, as people scratched their head and said, seed of the what? <laughs> dead and God wants it. Why does God want a dead animal, honey? I, I don't know. He says he does. It's, uh, something about a subset. I don't know. And, 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 you know, we look back with 2020 hindsight to the gospel. And they say, oh, it's so obvious. It was not obvious. <laughs> they didn't get it. Even the angels, we're told, tried to look into these things to figure out what in the world is God doing. But in the coming of Christ and the redemptive price he paid by his death and in his resurrection, we now, God now has the justification to himself. He doesn't have to justify himself to anyone but himself make satisfaction to his own nature. He is now able, with clear justice, to say, I'm still going to fulfill this world full of my image. People reborn into the image of Christ, into the image of God, into the image of Christ. And they're still going to work together, and they're still going to tackle really hard tasks. And this time, we're going to up the ante from facing a high mountain or a deep river to facing demons and persecutors and tyrants and worst of all, their own sins. And I'm still going to create that community. But it requires people. First of all, God wants lots of people because he wants to replicate his image. But this whole process of creating this, this community, he's not just creating a billion likenesses of himself. He's creating a community that in all of its interactions is an image of himself, mm -hmm. a female to his male, a bride for the one who's king. And it's only, and it takes a lot of people. Are, are, are 4 billion or 6 billion or 20 billion enough? Individually, no. But in all of the interactions, the interplay of love and grace and faith and wisdom, humility, leading, following, as all of that displays itself, yeah, the Bible tells us that Christ has a bride. And the bride, he knows the exact number of believers. It's going to take born-again Christians, people remade in his image, to fill out that quota and make that bride all that it needs to be for all eternity. And that's what he's about. And in the process, and here's the cool thing, in the process of growth and sanctification, and the, the two are similar but not identical, sanctification, growth, and grace and in this world, in the face of sin, that's a lot of our maturing. 
But maturity can go on after the resurrection. There's still going to be lessons to learn, things to know. Some of us will finally get to learn to speak French or to learn calculus or learn to sing on key or, you know. There's always going to be more we can learn and more we can grow in. But right now in this world, we have this incredible privilege of learning to trust God in the face of our own sins and the hostility of a fallen world all around us. And that's something that in an unfallen world we never could have had. Satan tried to destroy it and what he gave God was a stage where the stakes are infinitely higher and where to accomplish it, he had to kill his son. And that's amazing. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. The goal hasn't changed, but the way of getting there is so much greater. Brian? So in addition to that, hypothetical scenario, Adam remains faithful mm -hmm. throughout the rest of history. You know, there, there's, there's no sin. Basically, you would have Adam growing in his own righteousness over time as God revealed more of the way of, of life to him. Satan, instead, what happened is Satan tempted Eve and Adam was also likewise tempted and mankind fell. And you'd like most people hearing that would think like what Satan wants to think, wow, God lost. Mm -hmm. And instead, even the state which Adam would have been in and which he, he was originally in, is now considered less than what the believer has in Christ. Because instead yes. of having our own righteousness, we have the righteousness yes. of God's own son in human vesture. And when he comes again, we are going to be raised into the perfection of his holiness. Yes. That is yeah. something Adam never would have gotten on his own. Exactly. That's that's mm -hmm. wonderful. You can think here of uh, Romans 5, where the English is so convoluted because the Greek is so convoluted, because <laughs> the idea is, is, is not intuitive. Adam did this. Christ did the exact opposite, only so much better. <laughs> and it's, it, it's, he can never say, well, Adam this, but Christ this. Adam this, but Christ, but not, because... <laughs> He's God, and it's not, there's no comparison. So there's this contrast, but the comparison always fails because what Jesus bought for us, as you say, his own righteousness, the righteousness of the Son of God, we are not simply adopted legally as some kind of outward status because we're creatures and God's nice to us, but because Christ is in us and we are in him and his Holy Spirit dwells in us, that's, as you say, that's something Adam would not have had. And so Satan, in destroying as he thought, the first plan actually opened it up into something far more glorious than he could ever have conceived. And he gets to go through eternity kicking himself. <laughs> I fell into the trap. How could I have, I gave him exactly, I gave me a, he gave me a sword and I fell on it. To quote a former president. Um, yeah, that's, it's the wisdom and the, and, and the greatness of God in all of this. We sit back in amazement. But the point, to nail it down, because I'm guessing we're getting somewhere near time, this. So we've seen the, we've seen the cultural mandate or the dominion mandate. We've seen, we've seen what is. And we need to remember then that the Great Commission calls us not merely to win people to faith in Christ and leave them there, but to make them disciples. And that discipling thing is an ongoing lifetime process that takes place in a real world. Where do most people learn to be sanctified? I would suggest that in terms of practical outworkings, there's two places, family and work. <laughs> now, the grace comes to us through the word and sacraments. We know that. And we go to church not only to learn about Christ intellectually, but also through the, the gospel that's preached to be transformed. Yes, I'm not denying that. But where does that get challenged? Where does that get tested? Where do we get to put the rubber to the road and learn to live it out? Marriage with kids, <laughs> on the job problems. Where do you learn to control your temper? Where do you learn to not respond with the first thing that comes to your mind? Where do you learn to work really hard though you're tired and this is boring? Where do you learn to walk across the room and say, you can't do that, we need to talk? Where do you learn to say, stop, let's pray? 
And I would suggest that the obvious places are in home with your spouse, with your kids, and on the job as you confront the wider world. If you're a mechanic, it's when that blank, blanky, blankety, blankety car won't do what you want, <laughs> even though you've, I've done this all my life. Why isn't it starting the way it's supposed to? And you learn to trust God and you learn to, all right, let's, let me Google it. Um, I'll pull out the, the manuals. In another generation, pull out the manuals. Call old Ed over at the other store. We'll th we, yeah, we're competitors, but he'll help me. And you learn to handle problems in God's grace in a world of, as Brian said earlier, stuff, <laughs> matter. We don't go and sit on a hill and meditate on our navels and think nice thoughts at one another and hope to grow in grace. Mm -hmm. We grow in grace as we work with the real world and as we make stuff, learn stuff, reconcile stuff, help people. That's how it works. And mm -hmm. in any attempt to abstract it from there and put it just in the church building or just in the classroom or in a monastery or on some high hill or some high pillar, as if we, if we got away from culture and work and economics and politics, then we could really be more spiritual without those distractions. No, exactly the opposite is true. The way to become more spiritual is to carry the grace of God into real life problems and trust God to see us through them. And so there's no conflict here. There's no, it's not a question of choosing the cultural mandate over the Great Commission either way. Yes, people have to come to faith in Christ. We have to keep returning by faith to Christ on a daily basis. My wife uh, was remarking we, uh, with regard to some other issues that she heard someone who should know better say, yeah, but in our church, we hear the gospel all the time. I mean, we really don't have to, we don't really have to hear it every single time we go to church, do we? Oh. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> and, my and my response we is, eat yeah. every day. It's, yeah. <laughs> this is getting My tiresome. response actually was breathing. Yeah. Can, yeah. I don't need to breathe. I mean, that's really dull and I know all about it. Can I just go go without breathing for a couple of days and get back to it? It is the gospel's life. We never want it to, to vanish from our churches. We never want to derail it or, or push it to the background. But the fruit of the gospel is to conform us to the image of Christ. And the full outworking of that needs the stage, what we call the world, the earth, mm -hmm. the physical creation, stuff. And so, again, as far as I can see, there's no conflict here. In fact, there's a logical necessity. If we're going to go in grace, we need to go out there and be computer programmers, teachers, vocal coaches, uh, chefs, uh, car mechanics, you know, you, you name it, whatever it is. That's the nature of growing in grace the side product of which is this beautiful glorified world, which will delight the heart of our Heavenly Father. But mostly, he wants to see us as his bride. And anyway, mm -hmm. thus the title of all of this, Halting Toward Zion. We, we're headed toward this new Jerusalem, which the Bible uh, everywhere describes and assumes. Abraham looked for a city which has foundations, his builder and maker is God. Uh, that's not to say that he, uh, no one ever explained to that, to me as a kid. I'd sit in chapel at a Christian school and I'd hear that and I'd wonder, what city is that? What foundations are that? Jesus is called foundations. Is there a connection? No one ever told me. I don't know when I finally figured that one out. Uh, and, and we see pictures of it in the Psalms. Uh, and Emily, I think you, Emily, you wanted to talk about one of the Psalms before we quit. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 60, uh, Ezekiel's prophecies, finding the book of Revelation, and all the way along the line, this idea of this beautiful community that is the church, uh, and that reaches its fullness after the resurrection in eternity. So it might be worth mentioning as well that while the Dominion Mandate and, by extension, the Great Commission tell us that we should have children, that this is one of the ways that we make disciples, we live in a fallen world. And there are those who, in God's providence, are unable to have children. Mm -hmm. So... I'd like to hear from you a little bit, because uh, I have my own thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours. Well, I'm actually How... interested in yours. <laughs> oh, well, fine. I can give we my can thoughts We can do tradesies. Cool. Tradesies. Perfect. How the, the, the effects that uh, living in a sinful world has on one's body can 
or doesn't actually does not preclude one from having a faithful witness or living a faithful Christian life. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts on this, we have the witness in scripture of several people who were faithful to God's law and were not in sin by not having children. First and foremost, Jesus Christ. He did not have children. He did not get married. In that very limited physical sense, mm -hmm. he was not fulfilling the letter of that law. Now, obviously, and, we would and understand. And if the Pharisees and Sadducees had thought they could call him on that, they would have. They absolutely would have. So we want, I want to make sure that we understand someone in God's providence not being able to have children does not mean that they are not being a faithful Christian. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. This is a discussion, generally speaking, about those who are called to do such things and the witness of the church and humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, my thoughts, I think, are, are in complete harmony with yours. Uh, and I sense your, um, your great compassion for people who would love to have children and in God's providence can't, either because of circumstances, because of their bodily condition, or because other people who should be marrying them won't get their act together and propose. <laughs> and that's a real thing. That's my hot yeah. button these days. For real. Yeah. Um, we, we, we need to see that that was the plan and God's not rescinded it. However, because of the fall, because of uh, because of the curse, because of other god, godly people or God's people not fulfilling their end of things. Yeah, some people who would love to have children can't. And if it's not their fault, it's not their fault. And the wonderful thing, and, and speaking as you were earlier, of the, the greatness of the new covenant is you can have spiritual children without getting married. You can bring people to faith by witnessing the gospel. And that's just as eternal and actually more eternal than giving birth. Because you give birth, there's still the question of, and will they trust in Jesus? They still, and yes, we can make a distinction and should between covenant children and the children of unbelievers. And yet, in a sense, it's the same thing. They have to believe the gospel, whether they're covenant children or they're the or they're, they came into this world as unbelievers and unbelieving homes, they still have to hear and believe the gospel. And Jesus in uh, talking about whether those people who could lawfully, never, ignoring circumstances, who lawfully could abstain from marriage are those who've made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake. Paul comes to mind too. And there were prophets who were not married, where their gospel ministry required such focus and was going to be carried under carried on under such conditions that God said, yeah, that's fine. You're, 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 you're reaching the goal here by other means and their gospel-centered means. And so simply having lots of children in, in and of itself, and we see this, if I have more children, then I'm spiritually better than you. <laughs> and that goes all the way back to Hannah and Peninnah. Yeah. Um, mm. And no, Rachel. you're... You know, how Rachel and Leah, like Haley points this out, <laughs> the section my, my wife calls baby wars. She said having children should not be a form of biological warfare. <laughs> but there, there is that tendency to make anything we do a badge of self-righteousness and spiritual pride. Uh, and we can even do that with winning people to Christ. But God's goal is to save souls, human beings, and all that they are, body, soul, spirit, for eternity to be part of this community, which is the church. And that's his glorious goal. And yeah, we're all in this and we all play our part and we all play differently. We all have different things to do and that's okay. And some people need to hear that too. Well, I don't know much theology, I'm not very bright. God has stuff for you to do. Well, I'm kind of lame and antisocial and I don't get along with people. God still has things for you to do and so on. Right. Uh, just to uh, put a pin in that as well, there's a great quote that I came across recently. I think I found it on Twitter or something like that, but it doesn't matter. Where basically it said, you as a believer in Christ, you have more in common with a 12 year old Vietnamese girl who yesterday professed faith in Christ truly for the first time than you do 
with someone who shares all of your political and moral opinions who lives next door to you and does not believe in Christ. Mm. And I would, that's beautiful. I would take it Mm -hmm. further and say, and shares your theological convictions, but still doesn't know God. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Mm. It's about the, and, and here's a word some people won't like, the existential relationship we have with God in Christ through the, the the binding of the Holy Spirit, breathed eternally from Father to Son and Son to Father, and we together as the community of believers, believing the gospel, are caught up into that incredible fellowship. And there is no greater privilege, no greater. There's nothing greater than being the children of God, mm-hmm. and and knowing the love of God and having God as our inheritance. So, is there any conflict between the Dominion mandate, culture mandate, call, call it what you will, and traditional biblical Christianity? No, it's mm-hmm. just understanding maybe a step more of how it works and what some of its effects are going to be when 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 we get our act together and start living it out the way God would have us. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we're not rewriting Christianity. We're pointing to a dimension that sometimes I think it's neglected: maturity. Yeah. And in part two show that we're not just making this up. I'd like to bring in a psalm. Okay, uh, tell us a psalm. <laughs> uh, this is Psalm 67. Uh, our Sunday evening fellowship studied this last night, and I was like, this is, it's always providential because it's always, you know, the word of God having an effect on us. Like, <laughs> the, the psalm is always great. But this week in particular, it was so relevant to what we're talking about today. So I'm going to read it, but I'm going to read it out of order. And I'll tell you why. The structure of this psalm is chiastic, which means that the first verse and the last verse are parallel. The second verse and the second to last verse are parallel, and so on and so forth until you get to the very center. And it's short. It's only got seven verses. So I'm going to read verse four, which is the center of the psalm first. It says, Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. And then verses 3 and 5 are identical, so I'm just going to read them once. It says, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Now I'm going to skip and go to 1 and 7. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. And then verses 2 and 6. As a parallel, don't make sense unless we have this concept of taking dominion over the earth, subduing it, and winning people to Christ and making God's salvation known among all the nations as a unified concept in our minds. Verse 1 flows into verse 2. May God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. And skipping over to verse 6, Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. So there is this intimate connection between God's salvation being known upon the earth, the spread of the gospel, and the earth doing what it's supposed to do under our care. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. So as we are the people of God, He is our God. We are his people. We are dressing and keeping the earth. We are making his salvation known. This is all one concept um, that we engage in to God's glory. This is a beautiful argument and demonstration of this, but it's an idea that's not at all foreign to the Psalms and the prophets. But in the wake of dispensationalism, we've fallen either to well, that's for the the Jewish millennium when Christ reigns from Jerusalem. And then these earthly sort of things will have their place in a Jewish economy. Or we get what's more of an all-millennial interpretation of, yeah, but that's that, that's just figures of the of the spirit of the fruit of the spirit and the spiritual blessings we're, we're going to get because uh, God obviously isn't really concerned about plants. Don't these people eat? <laughs> anyway, that was that was beautiful, Emily. Thank you, and thank your uh, your study group for contributing. <laughs> yeah, shout out to David Lawrence. He's one of our listeners, so 
Thanks, David. And I think that's all we have time for. We have gone long, but that's to be expected with a topic like this. <laughs> so thank you so much, Greg and Brian, for this conversation. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you, David, our producer and my lawful wedded husband. Thank you all for listening. You should send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. That's, that's your that's your yeah. chance to insert something or to introduce insert. Brian or whatever you want to do. Do 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 do. Or we can go on. We can we can go ahead and go on. I think we'll put your doodly doodly do at the uh, after um, closing music. That'll be our, <laughs> our close out. This is my sure we're not, my sure we're not going to get sued for that <laughs> <laughs> copyright I, infringement. Well, have is, you is copyrighted it, it from Brian? something? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like X Files. All right, so oh. okay, taking a breath.